it for the very few people that are not familiar with your work. Can you briefly introduce yourself for us? Okay, well, I'm David Fox, and I've been in the game industry for over 40 years. Um, most of the games people know me for were when I was at Lucasfilm Games, which became LucasArts, and I was employee number three in Lucasfilm Games. Uh, started in 1982, uh, soon after it, it became a, an organization. And uh, the games I did while I was there were uh, Rescue on Fractalus. Uh, I was a project leader on, on Labyrinth, which was based on the movie. Then I came on as the, a scum scripter on Maniac Mansion. I was a project leader and designer on Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. Uh, I was a designer and coder on uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade graphic adventure, produced uh, a version of Pipe Dream, um, and then I guess I was the director of operations there uh, for about a year, and then worked on a location-based entertainment project called Mirage at Lucas. Um, more recently, um, I published a game called Rubeworks, which is based on Rube Goldberg's cartoons and, and chain reaction machines. And the most recent was Thimbleweed Park uh, with Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick, uh, friends from, from LucasArts, uh, which was a graphic adventure game, which was a Kickstarter project, which came out in 2017. That's really great. So, so much history so there. Much. I'm sure there must have been many. But can you recall your fondest memory from the time you spent at LucasArts? Multiple times when I was working on a small, you know, the teams were relatively small at the time. So on a team of other people, um, Zach McCracken was probably the favorite game of the ones I did because it was my universe, my game, my idea. Um, and I ha didn't have to ask someone else whether I could do this, I just could do it. All the other graphic adventures I worked on there, either were, two of them were based on movies so the story and characters were set, and we had to work within that universe. Uh, Maniac Mansion and Thimbley Park were Gary Winnick and Ron Gilbert's idea uh, concept, so I was working in their universe. Still a lot of fun, but not as freeing as being able to do my own. Um, but you know, ideas are just you know, brainstorming sessions, um, walking around the ranch, um, taking a bike ride, ride around, um, having one of many lunches there, um, taking my friends there and giving them a tour on lunch um, multiple times, screenings. Um, there were these great um, rap parties after a big production, film production was done, um, which were always exciting to see the movie and then go to these rap parties. Even if we didn't work on the film, we were invited. So it, it, was, it was a really good 10 years and I was there. Um, you know, it was a good company. This year is the 30th anniversary of Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade Graphic Adventure, the game you worked on. At the time, this game was considered to be the most innovative LucasArts adventure games. So what did you do differently there? Well, we had, uh, the first issue was we had a problem to solve, like, we figured that the majority of the people who had, seen, had who played the game had already seen the movie. So there were a lot of spoilers in the, in the movie so it wasn't really a surprise what the plot was going to be. Um, so that wasn't good. that wasn't what we were focusing on. On the other hand, there might be some people who, who a few people who didn't, and I actually met some people on this trip who said, "Oh, I I was too young to see the movie, so I played the game first, and then didn't see the movie for years later." So we had to balance between the two. Um, we couldn't let the movie be a spoiler. We had to come up with um, tasks that were fitting within the universe that we could expand it um, that, and we couldn't do that, have the same task that was identical to what was in the movie. So an example might be um, there's one task where you where Indy had to figure out how to get into the catacombs from Venice and in the movie he had to find a section that had a big X on the ground. Well that would have been too easy because people who had seen the movie would know where to go. So we created a, a grid of um, three by three with Roman numerals on it, and it would change based on which game you were playing. So it would be random, and you might have to go into one or nine, and, and each section was different. So, so you had to work it, work it out, use the 
the Grail diary that we packaged with the game, which had hints and information, and you can use that to help you figure it out. Um, and we, uh, the other big challenge was that time was very limited. Uh, we started the project in around December of, of that year, and the movie came out in, I think, in June. And we were, I think we missed it by a couple months, but we had to get it out pretty close to the launch date. So that's we had three senior designers on the game at the same time. You know, myself, Ron Gilbert, and Noah Faustine. Um, so we knew how to work together. We were very efficient. Uh, we knew we had to do um, at least one or two action sequences because it was an indie movie and the other games we had done before didn't have, the other adventure games didn't have that. So we had to figure out how to do that and make sure it fit within the, the feeling of the movie. So looking back at how design was done 30 years ago, do you feel the field has progressed in the meantime a lot or there are still aspects we might have lost track of along the lines? Yeah, the, well, there's stuff that we learned. Um, problem with when you're when you're engineering something, there's always I think you always underestimate how much time it's going to take unless you've done the exact same type of game before. Anytime you add new tech and new ideas, then it's really really hard to predict how long it's going to take. So you can learn by talking to other people, but it's hard to learn from someone else's experience. You're most likely going to have to do it yourself and then fail and mess up and then we adjust. Um, in in Thimbley Park, um, I felt Ron was very masterful at being the project leader, um, the lead for the game. And he wanted to um, get a working version of the game up really fast. So. We did what we call wireframe art. It really wasn't wireframe. It was like really, really rough, blocky versions of the rooms that we could throw together really fast and have a, a walkable version where you can go through the entire game. Um, and then pull back and say, okay, which of these were not necessary? And he said, we're gonna have to cut out at least 10 to 15% of what we have here before we go into real art with, with these rooms. And that was, difficult but really good because we saw there was a lot of rooms that added nothing to gameplay, um, didn't really move the story forward and we just tossed them um, and then went back and, and did them for real. Um, and once you put the money into the into the room it's much harder to let go of it because you say, oh, well, we put you know, three weeks of, of, of the artist's time into this and it looks gorgeous and we don't come attached to it. So this it was really good to do really rough versions of that. Um, I think otherwise, I mean, it, it worked pretty well. He, you know, he was pushing a lot to, you know, to make sure we were on time and we didn't drift too far off from the original. That's the other is like um, design, uh, game design, where you're creeping in size, getting larger and larger because you keep on adding new features, something will happen. You say, well, wow, that's a really great idea. Let's put that in, let's put that in. And he, he had to play the role of the um, gatekeeper and let's say, oh, that is a good idea. Let's put it over here. If we have time, we might do it, but let's push it. Push it. And, you know, but we all were you know, collaboratively able to suggest ideas and, and you know, if it was really easy to do, then it could go in. But if it was a major prop, you know, major implementation thing, then we'd have to check to see if we could squeeze it in. Overall, I, I felt like it was one of the smoothest game experiences for a team that I worked on. And I, I attribute that partly, mostly to Ron's decades of experience, but also the fact that all of us working on the team, on the game also were, you know, had a long experience of, of doing this. Plus the fact that a lot of the core members of the team had worked together before. So we already knew each other. We trusted each other. We knew that our rhythms, we could, when someone said, yeah, I just don't think that's a good idea. Um, people wouldn't push it through, they'd listen, and we kind of come up with ways to, to adjust. Okay, so tell us more about uh, your recent work. What inspired you to, uh, to do games for children and books for children? 
Well, probably my wife. Um, Annie is an educator, and she she got her degree in early childhood ed education, a master's degree in that, and she she was an accredited teacher, um, but she didn't like the restrictions of being a classroom teacher. So very early, we you know kind of went off in a different direction. Um, she was also doing game design in the 90s um, for kids. So she, she designed um, or co-designed uh, first, first three humongous entertainment games, yeah. Putt-Putt Joins the Parade, uh, Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon, Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon, and Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise. And then she did a bunch of other games for companies like Electronic Arts and um, other publishers like based on books like Natalie Books and Mr. Potato Head game. And um, so, you know, she's a writer primarily, but she also is a designer. So when we started doing our own content, you know, it would mostly be around books that she was writing, um, either children's books, books for, for middle school kids, um, say, nine to 14 year old kids, um, books for younger kids. Um, and that was a great opportunity for me to learn how to do projects for the for iOS or iPad by taking some of her content and then adapting it. Um, gave me a, a good you know, access to free, essentially free art. Um, and a, way, a quick way to get something completed rather than having to go through the, that whole production part. Um, and we still collaborate. I mean, we had a really good time um, 12 years ago doing a project for Disney. Um, we got to do design several overlay games for theme parks where you actually go inside the theme park and have a game you can play within certain areas of the park. Um, and one of those at Tokyo Disney Sea is still active. Um, you could so do it. It's like a kind of a treasure hunt style project called the Leonardo Challenge. So we, you know, we're, we're good at like that. But off, most of the time, we're working on separate projects, and then we'll say, "I want to show you this. What do you think?" And we're sharing. It. If you were to give one single piece of advice to someone who's just now starting their career in the gaming industry, what would that be? Know what your strengths are. Find a group, a small group of people who complement those strengths and do lots of projects. Because the only way to really gain the experience is by doing it if you just go to the class. And, and I think most schools that teach game design or, or game development know that. So they'll set up people and teams to do that. But you don't have to go to a, a college, university, or even a high school with those programs, you could do it on your own if you if you have friends who could do it and go the indie route. You know, most of what you do is going to be crap. <laughs> most of what you do is going to be not very good, um, but you kind of have to go through and do it so you can get the, the feel of it and feel working with the team, how to do a give and take, to recognizing what each person's strength is to let them you know, listen to their feedback on that. So if I'm, a, if I'm primarily a designer and maybe a programmer, maybe I'm not the strongest programmer, maybe I'll bring in another programmer. If I'm you know, not an artist, I could do block stuff, but I, I want a really good artist, so bring in someone who could do that. Maybe bring in someone who could do music and sound effects. Um, and you, know, get, you could do it with a relatively small team. And in the old days, we all had to do a little bit of everything, but now there's so many people interested in this that you should be able to find really talented people I and mean, I see on Twitter I, I see artwork and 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 listen to music of, of people that are just starting out that's that's amazing it's just I love it and those are the people you should grab you don't have to like, and it could be a virtual team obviously um, the movie park for example we use slack to communicate with each other um, none of us were in the same city um, my, so now we're, Multiple people were in other countries um, and having a place where all the ideas could stay and you could pick up the threads of what was happening by, by reading the different channels we had so that worked really well. So we had a writer in London, a playtester in London, we had a playtester in, in Czech Republic, I think she was, 
um, people on the West Coast, people, you know, it's all over the place. So, so there, no, re you don't need to do it with your friends in your town. You can do it you know, easy now to collaborate um, across the whole world.